welcome to the Meme Tune Program, Episode 2. In today's edition of Switched On, I'll be looking at the development of the analog polysynth in the first of a two-part special. Synthesizer Club features a unique EMS rig. I'll be working on the Bukula 200 in patching today. And I'll be looking at how I use video switches and chroma keys in Video Lab. But first, it's switched on. I'm in mid-1970s California and a marriage is about to take place that will set the music world on fire. It's the marriage between two synthesizers. In 1975, two pioneering manufacturers, Emu Systems and Oberheim Electronics, brought some of their inventions together to form a whole new breed of instrument. Emu had recently designed a polyphonic keyboard scanning system which enabled their customers to create basic polyphonic patches on their large modular systems. At the same time, Tom Oberheim had designed a compact monosynth in a box that was sold as a standalone synthesizer module for musicians to add to their keyboard rigs. When married together, these two products formed the basis for a whole new generation of instrument and the true analog polysynth was born. This gave rise to an explosion of pop, rock, classical, jazz and film music synthesizer artists who pushed the age of electronic music up to the next level. These artists made the most of the polysynth's ability to play multiple chords to layer up ever more complex compositions. The power of the electronic orchestra was now quite literally at their fingertips. For the first time, a composer could work on their own to create huge orchestral or otherworldly soundscapes without having to rely on other musicians. So when Tom Oberheim released his synthesizer in the mid-1970s, he really did create something important. Not only that, but the Oberheim 4 voice is, in my opinion, the best sounding analogue polysynth of all time. It does, of course, have its limitations, but as far as raw power and beautiful tone goes, there's nothing else that quite matches it. One reason it sounds so good is because I believe the 4 voice and the later 8 voice are the only truly discreet, fully programmable polysynths ever made. 
before I go on, let's just take a quick look at how synthesizers work inside. The elements that create the basic synthesizer voice are, as we saw in the last episode, as follows. Various VCOs and other sound sources go into a mixer and then into a filter and finally into an output VCA. These are shaped with note envelopes. In general, polysynths follow this same structure but can play more than one note at a time, which means ideally you need one monosynth per voice. Although this seems quite a simple progression to make, in 1975 this was not so easy to achieve. There is of course a deeper level to this sound producing architecture, the components that are hidden inside the machine. In the early days of synthesis, the only way of creating electronic circuits was with individual transistors, resistors, capacitors and other simple components. These were handpicked by the designer to do the things they wanted. Some designers were very talented at getting the best sound they could with the given components. But if you think about it, because of the incredible complexity of a discrete circuit board, they all use slightly different base components to create their circuits. This means that each instrument sounds unique. Most modular and monosynth systems that were built at this time were like this, and is one reason they sound so good. Sadly, the amount of time and cost involved in designing and making discrete synthesizers means that they became almost extinct after the mid-1970s. And the reason was the invention of this little thing, the Integrated Circuit, or IC. The IC did away with the need to design circuit boards component by component, because what they are is miniaturized preset circuit boards inside tiny sealed boxes. There were many different ICs designed over the years, but in the mid 1970s, a few companies started making synthesizer specific ones that ended up in virtually all the synths we know and love. In some ways, it was a fantastic revolution for product makers, opening up new possibilities for creating ever more advanced and complex machines and making them much more reliable and affordable. There was a boom in electronics of all kinds and synthesizers and especially polyphonic ones came into their prime. But in other ways something was lost in the sound of the synthesizers over the coming eras. It's not just nostalgia, there is something genuinely more powerful and pure about the early discrete synthesizers. And this is perfectly demonstrated with the Oberheim 4 voice. Nothing else in my studio sounds quite so raw and powerful as this instrument with all eight discrete oscillators powering through the handmade filters and VCAs.
Next time on Switched On Polysynths, I will take a look at how other manufacturers tackled polyphony with a look at some more classic vintage instruments. Polysynthy and double EMS AKS. I think the reverse is true. I think disco sold out to us, to be quite honest. I think disco started using things that we do. Uh, I think disco started using found sound. I think disco started using long tracks, started using repetition, and started using elements that we've been using for a long time. I don't think it's that we moved to disco. I think disco moved to us.
episode, I will be creating a simple sequencing patch on the Buchla 200 system. This instrument is made up from modules designed by Don Buchla in the 1970s. Although the modules you see here are all modern versions recreated from Don's schematics and panel designs. They are not original modules made by Buchla and Associates. Don Buchla lived and worked in California when California was the epicenter of the infamous counterculture movement, helping to change the music world and the rest of the world forever. His original 100 series modular system used the pioneering idea of voltage control to breathe life into its electronic circuits and was developed by him at the same time as, but independently from, Bob Moog's modular systems over on the east coast of America. Don's designs were much less conventional than Bob's and can best be described as being very open-ended, free-spirited and experimental in the way you work with them. He further developed his synthesis designs during his long years in the industry, eventually evolving them to incorporate digital technology and computer-based instruments. I was lucky enough to meet him at his workshop back in the 2010s when he was making his 200 E-series and I bought a modest-sized E-system from him. I ended up trading that modern system for a very early original Buchler 100 which I will discuss in another program. The instrument you see here is based on the middle period 200 series, a mostly analog set of modules, with the exception of the sequencer and digital delays. The way the Buchler works is quite different from other modular systems. For example, Don decided to use different patch cables for the audio path and the control path using jack cables and banana cables respectively. This forces you to think about patches in a surprisingly different way. He also had unique names for most of the functions in the system, as you will see later on. And nothing is quite as straightforward as it seems. This leads to a very complex set of options, because the modules interact together in many different and unexpected ways. However, I will try and keep this demonstration quite simple and show you how to get a self-playing voice set up but still with lots of evolving options to explore. To start, I will set up an initial clock which will run the whole patch. I'll take a function generator, essentially an envelope that can loop back on itself and send it to two places. Firstly, to the low pass gate, a combination of filter and VCA, and later it will be sent to run the sequencer. Next I will take a VCO, or complex waveform generator in Buchler speak, and send that to the gate. First I'll attenuate the VCO using one channel of a mixer, so it doesn't distort the rest of the system. The output of the clock goes into the 288 digital delay, called the time domain processor. And that will go to another mixer, and then to the final mix output. The delay module has outputs for the various time divisions it provides. So I'll take out the quarter note one and send it back into an audio input, allowing for the delay to feed back on itself and create repeating delays. Next, 
I'll take the clock source to trigger the sequencer. In this case, the multiple arbitrary function generator, or MARF. This is a very complex module and would take a three hour video to even start explaining its functions. However, I am just using it as a basic 16 step sequencer at the moment. I'll take the CV out and send it to the VCO pitch. I'll use a CV mixer so I can add another CV later on, which will enhance the pattern. The first 16 faders are the pitches we are hearing and the bottom 16 can be sent to control the timbre of the VCO. This sequencer has a second layer identical to the first but which can be assigned to another bank of faders. So to use it, I'll take a trigger from the end of the first sequence and use that to clock bank two, meaning it will step only once every 16 notes. I can then use these faders to transpose the first sequence every so often. In a pattern that lasts 16 times 16 notes, 256 in total. But before I run it all the way through, I want to add a few more elements to enhance the patch a bit more. First, I'm going to split the signal again into left and right sides of the programmable spectral processor, another highly complex module that I am only using for the simple task of stereofying the sound a bit more. Again, I will use a mixer so I can attenuate the level going into the spectral processor. I'll use two LFOs to modulate the frequency and the width of the spectrum. I'll also split the output again and send that through a bandpass filter and back into another input of the 288 delay. The final part of the patch is setting up a second VCO, but a few octaves down, that will go to the final mix, bypassing the delays altogether, just to round out the sound. And that's today's patch.
Back in 2015, I decided to try and make some videos to go with some of the synthesizer sketches I was making. I wanted to explore similar ideas to those that I do with my music by looking at old and forgotten technology to see how it can be used today. I started out with a simple analog camera and video mixer and learned how to do video feedback loops and basic video effects. I then got a second mixer so I could do interesting things by combining them together. But these mixers were very primitive and couldn't do some of the things I wanted to play around with such as resizing video and layering multiple images known as picture in picture. So I went on eBay and bought an old digital mixer but one which had more advanced features and higher resolution than the others. Combined with the older gear I could start to manipulate video in some very interesting ways. The idea behind a switcher is that you can bring in many video sources from any compatible piece of gear and have them all set to buttons on the mixer. I have various video playback machines and the other older switches connected up at the moment. There's a video output that goes to a master recorder, in this case my MacBook, and then I can manipulate the images in real time with the built-in effects. I can switch between sources, overlay them, change their size and positions, move them around, change the colours and resolution and create feedback loops. One very important feature of most vintage video gear like this is something called keying. This is where you overlay just one section of a video onto another. You need two sources and then you can choose how to select parts of the top layer to superimpose on the background layer. There are two methods, Luma key or chroma key. Luma uses brightness to choose, so for example only the bright bits get superimposed, which is good for overlaying text and simple shapes. Chroma uses colour to decide, and this is how you can do more complex things like this. All you do is shoot your video with a background as close to one unique colour as possible and then everything else gets superimposed on the background layer on the switcher. The classic way of doing this is with a green screen and it's an effect that I really like exploring. Here's a demo using video images and a green background to set up a composite video image.
Well, that's it for the Meme Tune program, episode 2. Coming up next time, Switched On features Analog Polysynth History, part 2. Synthesizer Club features a VCS3, Roland 100M, and Moog Modular. Patching Today features the amazing vintage ARP 2500. And Video Lab features some video feedback. Bye for now.